Today's episode is proudly sponsored by the Rising Tide Mastermind. The term mastermind was originally written in Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. Before that, the earliest documentation that we have of a mastermind group was Ben Franklin's group that he used to meet every single week in a tavern that he called Huntus. Nation, there's no doubt about it. Life is too short to do it alone, and it's not very much fun to do it alone in. Nation, I urge you to go to scalinguph2o.com and find out if the Rising Tide Mastermind is right for you. I'd love to have a 15-minute call with you to explain all things Rising Tide Mastermind and see if this is a group that's right for you and you are right for the group. Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind. Welcome to the Scaling Up H2O podcast. My name is Trace Blackmore and happy new year, Scaling Up Nation. It is 2024. We have 12 whole new fresh months in front of us. And it's my hope that you make these the best 12 months yet. I always love the end of the year and the beginning of the year because it's for me, it's reflection on what last year was and what did I learn from last year and what are some things that I can take into this year as successes and use them as a springboard. And that was really what the last episode was was me celebrating all the great things that uh, we've done together with this podcast in 2023. So I encourage you to do the same thing. Take a victory lap. What has happened in 2023? What are some lessons learned? What are some victories to celebrate that will propel you forward? And then what are you going to get done this year? I love the book, The 12 Week Year. And the 12-week year is uh, a book that we've talked quite a bit about on this podcast. We've got an affiliate link where you can go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash 12-week year, the number 12, and you can get a copy of that book or you can listen to previous episodes where we've talked about the 12-week year. I've mentioned the 12-week year on several episodes. One that comes to mind is 132. That was an older podcast out there. Uh, But you can learn all things 12-week year and more by listening to that podcast or maybe reading the book. But the thing I love about 12-week year is he recognizes that most of us are very efficient in December, also very diligent in December and getting things done because we don't have any year left. We're running out of year. So what he tries to do is harness that each and every quarter. You don't have any quarter left. You're out of your 12-week year. You basically treat every week as a month and it really changes how you work with yourself how you hold yourself accountable, and it works great with holding other people, helping each other hold themselves accountable. So I can't recommend enough the 12-week year. It's a great book to start reading this year, and the cool thing about it is it tells you how to plan. There are lots of books that do that, but it tells you what to do when your plan doesn't work. It tells you how to execute. It is an awesome book and a great way to start the year And that's really the premise that I wanted to do on today's episode is just talk about some great things that we can do to start this year off right. And of course, one of the things you can do is plan on one of the different conferences that are available to us as industrial water traders to go to. And I love that we have an international audience, so we like to make sure we're talking about the international conferences that are all over the world. And maybe you're a member of the American Chemical Society. Well, the Middle East and African Regional Conference is taking place in Abu Dhabi. That's a cool place. Wouldn't you want to go there? So that's February 4th through 7th. And this is where chemistry professionals all over the globe get together 
to try to advance technical knowledge. It's all about collaboration and advancement through research and education. So if you want to find out more about this, you can go to our show events page that, of course, is very easy to get to. Two ways. You can go to scalinguph2o.com, navigate over to our events page, or when you're typing scalinguph2o.com, you can put a forward slash events in there, and that will take you straight to that page. Now, I only list a few events each and every week. Trust me, there are so many more on our events page. If you're not going to our events page and checking that out, you are most likely going to miss something. And that might be bad news for you if something is coming to your backyard. An example of that is if you live in Orlando, Florida, on March 4th, the Water Quality Association is hosting their business boot camp. So this is where you take a day out of your business to learn how to work on your business. And it's all things business related for how to manage the field, to learn from fellow people within the WQA. And we're going to have all the information for that on our events page. Also, the 2024 Water Reuse Symposium is taking place March 11th through March 14th in Denver, Colorado. And this is all about collaboration around water reuse. So we talked about this a lot last year. We had a lot of Scaling Up Nation members attend that show. So maybe that's something that you want to attend or at least learn more about. So go over to our show notes page for that. And then the last one I will mention is at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana on April 6th through 10th, and that's the 9th International Water Association Resource Recovery Seminar. Well, Nation, I said one last thing, but actually here's one more last thing. Make sure you have on your calendars the very first hang that we are going to have for 2024. That's going to be on January 11th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Folks, I urge you to attend the hang. We always have so much fun. This is where you get to meet other Scaling Up H2O listeners. And of course, we call all of you fondly the Scaling Up Nation. So the entire nation joins in on a Zoom call. And I know what you're thinking. Oh my gosh, I get enough of Zoom calls. But this is different. This is fun. And we encourage you to come with a good attitude and ready to meet new people. And that's what this is all about. This is networking within the water treatment community. You get to instantly start talking to people that just know what it is that you do and you don't have to preface anything. When was the last time you could go into something that happened in your day without setting up all the background for somebody who wasn't in this industry. Well, that is what this is all about. And we will start promptly at 6 p.m. Eastern time on the 11th. And I've got a couple of announcements for you to let you know some things that are going on. And then we will get you into what is the jewel of the hang, where we will assign breakout rooms and you're going to meet people within the industry. You will meet somebody that will know something that you do not know that can help you with that issue that maybe you haven't even had yet. It's a great networking opportunity. So many people have helped each other on hangs. So many people have become friends because of the hangs. People have decided they're going to go to conferences on hangs. And then we wrap up with some sort of game where we just have fun and celebrate being together. And we do all of that in just one hour. So schedule that one hour in your week that is this month on the 11th, January 11th, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. You will be glad that you did. Now, you can register by going to scalinguph2o.com forward slash hang. Once again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash hang, or you can just go to the website, scalinguph2o.com and navigate over to the page we have for the hang. Either way, we hope to see you there. It's one of my favorite things to do because I get to see all of you. And folks, let me tell you, now where it's a brand new year, it's a great time to get your calendar out 
and put on your calendar all the things that you want to attend because you have all that time to protect. If you don't do that, what will happen? That time will get filled up and you won't be able to go to something that you might really want to go to and you might really learn something that might change everything in what you're doing. You might meet that person that can answer the thing that will change everything. Make sure you're taking time to block your calendar out while you have time and then everything else just seems to fill in the gaps. But if you'd work on the opposite, all those things that fill in the gaps, they fill in everything and you have no gaps and it's the same thing day after day after day. How do I know this? Because that's how I used to plan. I didn't plan. I ran from one fire to another. Folks, that is exhausting. Take it from me. Don't do that. Plan on what you want to do so you can do it when the time comes. Talking about how we're going to celebrate 2024, of course, we've got our great friend James McDonald, and he promised to bring us something brand new in the year of 2024. James, take it away. The next James is challenged as we grow as an industrial water treatment professional. Welcome to Thinking on Water with James. Hello and welcome to the Periodic Water Table with James. Welcome to Drop by Drop with James, the podcast segment where we wonder, explore, think about, imagine, and learn industrial water treatment, you guessed it, drop by drop, together. Water is amazing, and you're made of mostly water, which makes you amazing too. Now let's dive in and see what rises to the top. In today's episode, we're wandering through a reverse osmosis unit. Starting after the pump, just when the water enters an 8-inch RO membrane element itself. Imagine it, if you will. Imagine the water flowing into the feed channels between the membrane envelopes themselves. Imagine the pressure. Think about how suspended solids could behave at this entry point if they made it beyond the pre-filters. How might any suspended solids interact with the feed spacer material or surface of the membrane? Think about where any chlorine allowed into the RO system would start to impact first. What damage could it do? How soon? We have not passed through the RO membrane itself yet. No, we continue to flow down membrane elements passing from one to another still on the feed water side of the membrane. As our journey continues, we slow down a little as pure water passes through the membrane and there's less and less water on our feed water side. The speed probably picks up as we move from one stage of the array to the next with a lower number of membrane housings to ensure proper velocity and turbulence to help keep the membrane surfaces clean as we press onward to navigate around the feed channel spacer material. Although we are flowing between the membranes, we may be tempted to flow around the membrane elements themselves, out by the membrane housing. What could stop us, right? But something does. What is that something? Is it the brine seal? Something we haven't paid much attention to until now is that our water chemistry is changing. It is becoming more concentrated. When does this become a problem? Where does it become our problem? How does it become our problem? As we wind our way through the RO array stages, membranes, and piping, we finally reach our point of exit where we are called reject or concentrate. From here, we are either sent down the drain or sometimes captured and reused in other applications with less restrictive water quality requirements. I'm James McDonald, and I want to encourage you to be like water by forming bonds with those around you, dissolving new knowledge, and making worthy ripples. Drop by drop. 
Well, the suspense is over. Drop by Drop with James McDonald is our new podcast segment this year. And what a great name. Of course, we all know James wrote a book called Drop by Drop. It is a great book for so many things, industrial water treatment. There are things in there that will answer questions you did not even know to ask. And we'll, of course, have an affiliate link on the show notes page. And if you want to get James's book, you can go to Scaling Up h2o.com forward slash drop by drop. James, thanks for all you do. We look forward to a new and exciting drop by drop with James each and every episode of Scaling Up H2O. As I said at the top of the show, I really like to take the end of the year and the beginning of the new year to reflect and look forward on things that I can do to live my best life, make sure that I am doing the best that I can. And in looking for things to talk about today, I was inspired by a conversation that somebody was sharing with me. And his name is Aaron Walker. He's been on this podcast several times. He's one of my mentors. And he was sharing where he took his grandson out hunting for the first time. And he lives in Nashville. Honey's a big thing there. And his grandson shot a deer, and he was so proud of his grandson. He, of course, had a picture of it, of the deer, all of this stuff. And as he was telling the story to this other hunter, the other hunter got his phone out and said, oh, well, let me show you the size deer my grandson got this weekend. And Big A, that's what we call Aaron Walker, was was so kind of deflated where he really wanted to brag on his grandson. And the other guy really didn't give him room for that. And he just wanted to one up. And I think a lot of times in conversations, we do that. Oh, well, you did that? Well, listen to what I did. And I I don't think that that's the best way to have conversations. And depending on what those conversations turn into, it's a lost opportunity. And after hearing that story, it really inspired me to talk about what we're going to talk about on today's episode. And it's about relationships. And I know we normally talk technical about water treatment, but I know for a fact everybody that listens to this podcast has multiple relationships. And folks, at the end of the day, our life is all about the relationships that we have. So I thought we would talk today about some of the things that some people have taught me that I am by no means a master. I am just passing on the information. I am a student And I want to bring your attention to certain things in a relationship with how we respond and how we act in a relationship that can tell us that we can do a better job. Just like that conversation that I was told about about the deer, that could have gone so differently where we could have just reflected some feelings. You must have been really proud of your grandson. Asking questions. Well, what time did you guys get up in the morning? Was it difficult to carry the deer back out? Are you planning on going hunting again? Just those little bit of questions would have given Big A the the need that he was looking to fill there. And then as soon as he got that, he probably would have asked, well, you have a grandson, does, does he hunt? And that would have opened up the dialogue and that would have changed the entire conversation instead of two people talking without either of them really listening. So with that in mind, I want to talk about kindness because that's really what it's all about. And of course, I can't talk about kindness without bringing in my friend Kathleen Edelman. We talked about her a little bit on last week's episode, but she has done so much in teaching me about myself so I'm able to give more to all of my relationships. And it's one of the best gifts anybody has ever given to me. And as I said, I am a student. I am by no means a master of this. Kathleen is just amazing in what she's put together and how she teaches people and how she's taught me to teach other people. So with that, she's come out with another book. My goal isn't to sell books, but it is a wonderful book, and it's a great conversation starter for some other people, especially people if you wanted to read the book together. 
So it's scalinguph2o.com forward slash I-S-T-H-T 2023. I know that sounds ridiculous, but if you can remember, I said this, you heard that. It's the first initial in each one of those. And that's the link that we put together. We do that just to make it really easy for you to find. But we're going to be talking a little bit about the temperaments, but then also I want to bring some conflict resolution into this. I had another mentor teach me how to facilitate, and he did that by example. Last week, I talked about Major Dick Winter, and he said, leaders say, hey, let's follow me, or you guys follow me. And that's what this gentleman did. And of course, I'm talking about Tim Fulton. And Tim Fulton showed me what a top-notch facilitator did. And I've had him on the show before as well. And by watching him over years and being the product of all of the different things that he's guided me in as a coach over so many years, I have been able to become my own type of facilitator. And it's one of my favorite things to do with other companies, other people. And unfortunately, when you're in that situation, people ask you to come in for conflict resolution. And this is what has been shared with me for conflict resolution, but it doesn't have to be used for horrible conflict resolution. It can just be used as an awareness with how we're communicating What's really going on with the dialogue? Can I recognize something in myself or somebody else? And how am I responsible to make that relationship better? So in addition to Kathleen Edelman, I want to introduce somebody you might have heard of, maybe not, Dr. John Gottman. He was a psychologist, and he was actually working with uh, married couples. And in doing so, he came up with predictors for divorce. Now, this is not a marriage show, this is a relationship show, but this comes straight from where two people, that's a couple, they're working together or not working together. And with these four items, he was able to determine if these people were going to make it or not in their relationship. And I hear he was pretty accurate. So whether you are listening, how do you make your relationship with your spouse better? How do you make your relationship with your children better? How do you make your relationship with people you work with better, with people that are close relationships to you? This works for everybody. And I want to share it with you. It might be a review for some of you. It might be the first time the rest of you are hearing it. But I want you to think about this and think about some of the disputes that you might have had and what role you played in that and how by playing that role, it really didn't make things better, it made things worse. And I don't know why that is, but our brains are connected in such a way where our default response is normally the worst thing that we can possibly do. We have to educate ourselves, we have to train our brain to respond differently than how we want to respond by default. And I think the thing that comes to mind right now is hurt people hurt people. Well, that doesn't fix anything. And if somebody's hurt and the other person helps heal, imagine that conversation. So that's what I'm hoping to get out of this conversation. And we're doing this in the beginning of the year because you're going to use this each and every day this year in every relationship that you have. These are the four things that happen when conversations are not going well. And the first one is criticism. So criticizing someone is different than offering a critique or voicing a complaint. Now, the voicing a complaint or criticizing is about a specific issue. However, criticizing someone is actually attacking their character. So let me explain. So here's some examples in uh, the document that I have by Dr. Gottman. His example says that uh, in an argument, somebody says, as a criticism, you never think about how your behavior is affecting other people. I don't believe you are forgetful. You're just selfish. You never think of others. You never think of me. All right, now that is a criticism. We can all hear that, and that is definitely showing some blame. It's showing some hostility. Well, here is the complaint version of that. 
I was scared when you were running late and didn't call me. I thought we had agreed that we would always call each other when we were running late. Notice the difference there. Now, the same thing is going on, but they used I statements, and the criticism was you statements. So here's the goal here. In a criticism, we typically say, you always do this, or you never do that. And I'm sure you can hear yourself saying this, or even somebody saying this to you. And when you make a blanket statement like that, it's not true because that doesn't always happen, or it doesn't always never happen. You know what I'm saying, but that's the quote. With that, when you use the word you, it's very accusatory. When you use the word I, it's now telling people how you feel. And people can't argue with how you feel, and that's the real key to this. When you feel that you need to criticize someone, think about, okay, how do I turn that into maybe a complaint or maybe a statement about what's going on with me right now? And that would be simply to tell them how you feel or what you need. And the simple way to do that is to just use I statements. Again, people can't argue with that because it's how you feel. It's what you need and you're not accusing the other person, and that now allows you to have that conversation because with just doing the criticism, you're not going to get a resolve. A hurt person hurts the other person, hurt people hurt people. Now we're trying to heal. Okay, this person did something that really upset me. I need to let them know that. I owe that to them because I care about the relationship. But I need to do it in a way that doesn't damage the relationship. In the end, it strengthens the relationship. So that's the first one. And actually, uh, Dr. Gottman called these the four horsemen of relationships. And of course, he's referring to the apocalyptic story. So with this, he says that if we have these four issues, and the first one we just learned was criticism, they were a big predictor, and the married people that he was working with would get divorced. So the next one is contempt. And this is when others communicate just being mean, treating people with disrespect, mocking them with sarcasm, ridicule, calling them names, maybe mimicking them or using body language such as eye rolling or scoffing. So we can see this isn't very kind. And the target of contempt is to make the other person feel worthless. Well, folks, right there, Hurt people hurt people, but if we are doing that, well, that's not making the relationship better. So if we ever feel that we are trying to make someone feel despised or worthless, hey, that is something that we need to change our reaction, and we now need to figure out what do we do to actually fix this. So... I want to go a little bit further into deeper. While criticism attacks the person's character, contempt assumes that the person that's doing the criticizing has a moral superiority over the person they are talking to. So contempt is normally fueled by long, simmering, negative thoughts and arguments where one person is thinking about something that happened for a long, long time, and that's a bad thing to never have unresolved arguments because they are just fuel for little arguments to turn into huge bonfires. So if you have things that you need to talk about with somebody, it's always a good idea to go ahead and do that. And contempt is what Dr. Gottman said was the biggest predictor of divorce. When people start talking this way, when people start acting this way, he would say nine times out of 10, if they didn't fix it, they were not going to fix their relationship. So the question now is, what do you do when you realize that you are getting ready to use these words? Well, I like to invoke what Kathleen Edelman taught me, and she taught me that kind words are cool. In fact, that's the name of her company. 
she went on to say that the words we use are a gift that we choose to give other people. So the technique she taught me was the pause, and I ask myself, I will pause and ask myself, are the words that I'm getting ready to speak a gift that I am giving to the other person? And I cannot tell you how many times I changed the words that I was going to say. Now, for those of you that do the temperaments or have read the temperaments that we talked about earlier, I am a red temperament, which means I need to tell people things that they just need to know. But I can also tell you that after I tell them, I have to do a lot of repairing to that relationship. And it would have gone a lot smoother, a lot easier, and a lot faster, ultimately giving me what I wanted in the beginning to speed up the conversation if I would have taken this advice. So before I say something, I pause and I actually speak in my mind's ear. Mind's eye is a comment, so we just invented the mind's ear. And I will say to myself, pause. Are the words I'm getting ready to say a gift for the other person? And normally the answer is no. And I then think to myself, how do I change my words to act as a gift? Now that's easier said than done. And I know it takes practice. And in the beginning, you're going to fail a lot. And in the beginning, I failed a lot. And I still do fail a lot. And when I do fail, I apologize and I repair it. And I try to use that to get better. But I'll ask myself, how do I show the other person respect and appreciation? And if I do that, whatever words come out next are normally the right words. Another way to look at this is Stephen Covey's emotional bank account. It's been a couple of episodes since I've actually talked about the seven habits of highly effective people. So I want to go ahead and talk about the seven habits of highly effective people. One of my favorite books of all time I was given that when I was 19, and it was just something that helped me each and every day of my life, and I still refer to it. I read it at least once a year, and it was not included on my book review that I did last episode because I reread that. So those were only 62 new books that I read this year. Maybe I do need to keep track of all the books that I reread. I just don't don't count those. Anyway, Stephen Covey had this concept of an emotional bank account. And he said, how do I really know where I am in a relationship? And he equated that to a bank account where you have deposits and withdrawals. Well, deposits are showing respect and appreciation, letting the person know that they're something meaningful in your life where a withdrawal is exactly the two things we are talking about, and actually the total of the four things, these are all withdrawals that we can make. And Dr. Gottman said that you need five more positive deposits for every one withdrawal that you take to have a healthy relationship. As I was reading that, I remember my dad saying, of course, he said it in words that I can't use on a family-friendly podcast, but he says it takes 10 attaboys to make up for one ah, and you put in the exclamation uh, synonym that you want to put in there, but he said that you needed uh, you need 10 attaboys to make up for one mistake, so he was even twice as much as uh, the good doctor tells us. So the point is you want to make sure you're doing more deposits than you are doing withdrawals. And how do you do that? How do I show respect and appreciation for the person? Now, here's an example in Dr. Gottman's book. He said that uh, in one of the couples that he was interviewing, one person said, you forgot to load the dishwasher again. Ugh, you are so incredibly lazy while rolling the eyes. Now, a better thing to say is I understand that you've been busy lately, but could you please remember to load the dishwasher when I'm working late? I would really appreciate it. So you see, that still allows the person to know that they need this done, that it would really help them, that maybe even they're disappointed that it's not done, but it's done in a way that doesn't take away from the other person. 
So that is the second horseman. That is contempt. So the next one is defensiveness. Defensiveness is a common response to criticism. And I know we've all been defensive, but this is defensive when you feel like you need to find an excuse so you can now become the victim to whatever is going on. So not really acknowledging what is going on, just the, you know, everybody's against you, you're the victim, uh, maybe playing the martyr, if you will. And you can probably play back some scenarios in some conversations that you've had where maybe somebody's done this to you or you've done this to somebody. And maybe it seems like you're accepting responsibility, but you're really not. You're almost withdrawing from the conversation. So the example that they have, and this is the question, the wife said, did you call the neighbors to let them know that we're not coming tonight as you promised this morning? The defensive response was, I was just too darn busy. As a matter of fact, you know just how darn busy my schedule was today. Why didn't you just do it yourself? So there you go. So we're being defensive. We're turning it around. And here's the fact. That person was busy. They didn't have time to do it. But the way they posed that response back, it didn't allow for that relationship to grow, for those two people to learn a little bit more about, okay, well, why was this a big deal? How do we fix it moving forward? How do I give you the gift that you need and the other person give the gift back? So in the defensive response, it's reversing the blame and making it the other person's fault. Now, granted, that's not really a gift that we give to other people. So instead of that, we can do a non-defensive response, and this is where we are accepting responsibility. We're admitting that we're at fault. We're understanding the other person's perspective. So whatever's going on, they're upset with that. If we can acknowledge what that person is experiencing, it gives them psychological oxygen. Stephen Covey talks about that in The Seven Habits. And he talks about a metaphor that if we were all in a room and the oxygen got removed, we could care less what somebody was saying or what we were listening to. We would just care that we did not have oxygen. Right now, we all have oxygen, and until I mentioned it, oxygen was the last thing from our minds. He says in The Seven Habits, fish discover water last. I love the little things that he says in the book. But that's the case there. We need to give the people psychological oxygen to diffuse the situation, to acknowledge what they're going through, and ultimately make the relationship better. So here's a better response there. Oops, I forgot. I should have asked you this morning to do it because I knew my day was going to be packed. That's my fault. Let me call them right now. There you go. What would the two responses be when the person was defensive and then when the person was actually taking responsibility? When they took responsibility, that's a better conversation and we are able to grow the relationship. So think to yourself, how do I take responsibility? How do I not shift the blame to the other party? And in saying all this, I know you're thinking, Trace, this all sounds great, but I did this little thing and the person came back with this huge, inappropriate response and I need to teach them a lesson because what they did was so much worse than what I did I can't apologize or I can't take responsibility for what I did because of what they did afterwards. I get it. I can think of a dozen situations where I've had that situation myself, but I'm going to tell you in every single one of those situations, when I act by default, I do not get what I want and I normally make the situation worse. And if I do care about the relationship, and I normally do, 
I now have to repair. And that takes so much more work where I'm already to the point where I can just help. And if I'm going to do that to begin with, why not make it as easy as and as stress-free as possible on both sides of the relationship? And I just take responsibility for what I did. Now, what they did was horrible. And if I knew your story about what they did, I would probably have a hard time with what we're talking about too. But I will say that in my own experience and knowing when I take responsibility for the part that I played in the situation, not worrying about what they did afterwards, normally what happens is they reciprocate. Because I now showed them that I was a person of character and I now actually taught them that lesson that we were trying to do before when we were trying to act by default and being hurt and wanting to hurt. By acting properly and with character, they now normally see the errors in their ways they apologize and say, well, I really shouldn't have said what I said. And actually, it really wasn't that bad. And now we just fix the entire argument or wherever the disagreement came on. So that's something that I would encourage you to do is don't take the weight of all the wrongs of everybody else. Life's hard enough. Only accept responsibility for yourself, but do it first. And when you do that, I promise most people will follow suit and that relationship will be so much better and you will know how to respond even better the next time it happens. All right, so to recap, the four horsemen are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and number four is stonewalling. Stonewalling is a response to contempt. And this is typically where the listener withdraws from the entire interaction. Now, this is one where maybe there was some sort of argument and somebody's just tired of arguing, or maybe emotions are so high that people just need time to process. And for those of you that are familiar with the temperaments that we keep talking about, You will learn, or maybe you already know, that there are four temperaments. Two of them think internally, and two of them think externally. And a lot of people that think externally will misinterpret stonewalling for them needing space to process. I tell you, the temperaments is one of the best things that I did, not only to understand myself, but every key relationship in my life. Knowing that, I can now realize that I'm not giving that person time to process. And in that, I can invite them into that time to process. So if I notice that, and if I, especially if I know the temperaments, and for those of you that are familiar with the temperaments, those are going to be your greens and your blues, I might say, look, let's take a pause, let's step back for 15 minutes, and let's come back and talk about this. Now, for you greens and blues out there, these are the introverted temperaments. It's up to you to realize, ask for that space and silence that you need to process before the misunderstanding happens and say, hey, we're not having a great conversation now. I really need time to think about this. I need that time, but I wanna come back and process this later. I read somewhere that 15 minutes seems to be a magic number, but of course, that's going to vary depending who the person is. So pick whatever your magic number is. If you don't have one, maybe start with 15 minutes. And in these two examples, it was either you initiating the pause, the timeout, or the other person initiating the pause or the timeout. That is key, respecting that timeout, because if you're an introverted person, you need that. But here's the thing, you have to, have to, have to come back to that because if you're not coming back to that, that's now going to leave kindling for the next argument. And the small argument is going to turn into a bonfire and then we're going to see things like criticism, contempt, and defensiveness. So we have to deal with these things or it's going to come back. And I guess we'll see stonewalling as well. So make sure if you say you're going to come back to it, you do come back to it 
And make sure that if you can do this, this is key. Allow the other person to speak first. I really want to understand what you're going through. And this takes practice. And if you are convinced that you are right and the other person has wronged, it is not the right space. And you're probably right. You probably are right. And the other person was wrong in this instance. But what does it matter? In the grand scheme of the relationship and all the things that we have going on, does it really matter? And when I think of all the times I've dug my heels into arguments because I was right and I knew I was right, I can't remember any of those. But I remember how I felt and I remember how I made the other person felt. And I normally remember what I had to do to get back in their good graces because I was trying to prove that I was right. Can't even remember what it was I was trying to prove that I was right, but I remembered how I made that person feel. Or I remember how that person made me feel. Just imagine if we were able to put that aside and say, you go first. And here's another thing from Seven Habits. You don't start talking until the other person understands that you understand how they feel to their satisfaction. Okay, other person, what I hear is that you feel this way or that you feel that this happened. And again, that was an I statement. This is how I'm interpreting it. And now it's up to them to say, yes, that's exactly it. And if they say that, that's that psychological error that we're talking about. And now they're ready to listen to you. If that's not it, they might still be heated. No, you're not listening. That's not it at all. Okay, I, I want to listen. I, so, so tell me again. I want to get this right. Now the person they know that you want to hear them. It changes the entire intent of the original conversation. And eventually you'll get to that point where they will acknowledge that, yes, what you're saying is exactly what I'm saying. And they feel understood. Once they feel understood, they can start looking at the situation through your lens. And most of the time you will realize that you are not as far off as you thought you were, but you were so so invested in being right, you couldn't see what was. Nation, those are the four horsemen. I'll tell you again if you want to write them down. So we got criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. And through those four, Dr. Gottman was able to figure out if couples were going to make it or not. I was taught this, that when we were doing conflict resolution in a boardroom, how I can make sure two parties would come together. That's originally what I was taught. And then I added in Kathleen Edelman's temperaments, which I shared with you today. And then also all the things that I learned from Dr. Stephen Covey in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, I don't want you to think that's all I do is conflict resolution in boardrooms. But sometimes people aren't able to say what they need to say, and they need a platform in order to say it. So I will teach teams how to use tools like this so things don't get heated. We can always have good dialogue that leads to healthy conflict. You don't want to avoid conflict. You always want to have conflict, but you want to do it in a healthy way. I don't think what you are proposing is going to work. If I don't say that and we're not able to have healthy conflict and talk about it respectfully, then I keep my mouth shut and secretly I'm thinking it's going to fail the entire time. And if it does, and most likely it will, because I might inadvertently help it fail, I'll say, well, I could have told you it would fail in the beginning. We're never going to get anywhere unless we have healthy conflict. And it's my hope that you learn how to make all your conflict healthy in every relationship that you have. And today is a great day to start. You've got so many days left in this year. And I would just love it if this was the year of kindness, if this was the year of understanding, if this was the year of building relationships. When I look around and I see whatever system you want to put into this box, it's broken. Why is it broken? Why is one side not talking to the other? 
And you can see each one of these four horsemen that we just talked about. You can see that people don't understand their own temperament and how that comes off to somebody else with another temperament and how to use the best words, how to use the most kind words and all the things that we talked about in Seven Habits. So if I just reach one person today... That's enough because this is what the world needs right now. And if I did reach you with this, it's my hope that you share this podcast with somebody because this is something that anybody can listen to. You do not need to be in the water treatment industry. This is something that will help everybody, and it's something everybody needs help with. Help me help the rest of the world. And I'm sure you've got some people that I can probably interview that know way more than I do. I'm just talking about things that people taught me that other people developed. You might know some of these people that actually developed these things. We would love to get them on the podcast. And Nation, I'd love to hear your stories if this actually helped you with something that you were going through or something that you had some conflict with. If this helped the relationship, and then that ripple then carried across to that other person's relationships. Nation, have a great 2024. I will, of course, have a brand new episode for you each and every week this year. I can't wait to share my Friday with you. And if you don't mind, share this with somebody that you think needs to hear it. Have a great week, folks. Happy New Year. Do you wish you had your own private tutor to help you study for the Certified Water Technologist examination? Well, now you do. So many of you have asked me to help you with the mock CWT examination, and I've done that very thing. If you go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep, again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep, you will see that I've created a course and I tell you everything I know about each one of those mock questions. It's my hope that that helps give you the confidence you need to sign up to get certified today. 